Dave Elder Voss has has written a work of magisterial intellectual synthesis that also develops key novel concepts. So I hesitate to trivialize it by bringing in one of the most annoying men alive. But at a few points while reading Dave's book, I found myself applying his theory to Elon Musk. Musk was in Delaware Chancery Court yesterday testifying in a lawsuit about his 2018 Tesla pay package that netted him $50 billion in personal wealth. How does Musk get to invent his value to Tesla as 50 billion, I wonder? I don't have what Dave calls a lay theory of Musk's value that puts it at 50 billion. We have other theories of value, like the orthodox economic definition of, of a price as a market equilibrium between buyers and sellers. But Musk was a contract negotiation in a tiny closed circle of company board members. There was no market for Musk's package. I can't imagine that 50 billion reflects the value of Musk's labor. And of course, Marxists would call his payout a travesty of the labor theory of value rather than an expression of it. I can see the collective labor of all Tesla employees creating the company's value, but that would mean a much more egalitarian division of company shares than the one that gives $50 billion worth to the chief executive. So what does Mr. Musk say for himself? He testified in Delaware court that there would be no global electric car market on the current scale without Tesla pushing it relentlessly. I mean, I do love electric cars and think that Musk might be right about that. He also said that he had no hand in creating the package, implying that it expressed the professional judgment of those who best knew his direct contribution to the aggregate value of Tesla shares. Musk added that anyway, the 50 billion was so he could create SpaceX, which has incalculable social value for humankind, which is thanks to him on its way to Mars. So with Musk and the standard economic understanding of him, we have this situation. A, a, a genius level channeler of the creative forces of the universe, an Ayn Randian Superman whose compensation package expresses his true world historical social value, and who rightly ignores social or ethical judgments about the value of Tesla, high in a narrow product range, and of SpaceX, negative, in my view, as a real disaster for public science. So it appears that in our standard framework, there is little that people or their societies can do to get some control over this heroic discourse, not to mention control over venture capital and finance and product directions and the economic policy that seems focused largely now on making things harder rather than easier for regular people. So we're stuck wagging our fingers from the bleachers. So enter Dave Elder Voss, whose book gives us excellent conceptual tools for organizing this mess and perhaps even for redesigning it into a different set of economic mechanisms. The book is also a really valuable overview of economic thought. And I have to add that his writing is extremely direct and clear and a genuine pleasure to read. Um, before I turn it over to Dave, let me just say a, a word about the Independent Social Research Foundation, which is hosting this event. Dave's is the 19th in the ISRF series of book launches of Fellows Books. Um, we've recently published three issues of our bulletin on themes that emerge in Dave's book as well as in many others. The most recent issue is called On Disability. Uh, an issue just before that was Living with Crisis and Post-Individualism was the title of the third. Fellows books really cover the waterfront from Mike Macon Waits on how community interventions dealt with white supremacist individualism in Burnley to Jonathan Saha's book, Colonizing Animals, on how the colonial project decimated non-human creatures while also depending on relations with them, and on to Julia Late's The Disappearance of Lydia Harvey, about a young New Zealand woman who was sex trafficked to London in the early 1900s, where a combination of individual battling and support structures produced a surprising end to the story. And then most recently, The Limits of the Numerical, which we launched at Cambridge last month, on how to equalize relations between the quantitative fields, including the one that Dave is discussing tonight, and all the other modes in which we understand our lives. All these authors in different ways are denaturalizing the social and economic relations we take for granted so that we can imagine how to organize things differently. I share their faith in the intelligence of everyday people as we try to work with each other to rebuild our world. The ISRF is extremely grateful to this collective body of authors and to their respondents. 
for their work and thought and generosity. So thanks to you, Dave, and to you, Angela and Jamie, for contributing to what looks to me like a growing intellectual movement. Okay, so uh, as Lars noted, we'll hear from Dave um, for 15 minutes or so, and then from our two expert commentators, uh, Angela, first coming to us from Longborough University, and Jamie from Leeds Beckett. They're gonna speak for about five to seven minutes a piece, then Dave will respond and then we'll open it to the floor. And many thanks to you, all, all of you in the audience for being here to think about this important topic with us. Okay, and then briefly, Dave Elder Voss has a PhD in sociology from Birkbeck College and is currently an honorary fellow at Longborough University where his teaching and research focus on the digital economy, digital society, sociological theory, social ontology, economic sociology, and the creation of value and profit in the financial sector. His articles include The Causal Power of Discourse and Disassembling Actor Network Theory. And he is the author of three volumes at Cambridge University Press prior to the Cambridge volume that we're discussing today. And these are The Causal Power of Social Structures from 2010, The Reality of Social Construction in 2012, and Profit and Gift in the Digital Economy 2016. It's a real pleasure to have you with us, Dave. Now, over to you. Thank you, Chris, for that, uh, that very uh, generous introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank you know, yourself and Lars and Stuart and um, Despina for organizing this event. And, and of course, Jamie and Angela for taking part. Um, and I should also thank the ISRF uh, again for um, funding a political economy research fellowship a few years ago, um, which gave me a chance to start working on this book. Um, one challenge for me has been that it's already well over a year since I sent the last draft of this book to the publisher, uh, and I spent the year in between working on other things, um, like profits, as you mentioned, um, which means I needed to refresh my memory of this book by rereading re it myself. And one of the things that struck me in rereading it was that it essentially it's essentially composed of three parts. So, or the, the first two actually overlap quite a bit in the, in the actual structure of the book. So the first part is concerned with um, discussing the existing literature on value and financial value. Um, I start by kind of briefly explaining and, and dismissing the neoclassical and the Marxist accounts of value. And then I move on to look more kind of constructively by picking out more useful, relatively more recent work on value. Um, including work by classic work by John Maynard Keynes and almost classic, I suppose, work by Pierre Bourdieu, as well as more recent work from the uh, economics of convention tradition, including people like Andre Orléon and Jens Beckert. Um, and, and finally, the kind of emerging field of valuation studies. Um, and those, those more recent um, authors and traditions then get pulled into the second part of the argument, which is elaborating my own theoretical ontological argument about the construction of value and financial value, drawing on those earlier thinkers, but then uh, going beyond the previous literature in, in ways that I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. And then the third part of the book, um, maybe more distinct, and that's a set of three chapters that look in more depth at um, empirical cases from the finance sector, I think partly in order to explore how the theoretical model applies to them and, and, and partly to show how we can use it to explain the ways in which value is constructed or has been constructed in those areas. Uh, so they both make use of the theory and in showing that it's useful, hopefully help to confirm whether it's, it has worked. Uh, today, though, I want to focus on the, the second part of the book, which is um, you know, the, the more constructive part, and in particular about a couple of the ideas that it introduces, uh, the concept of uh, lay theories of value and asset circles. Uh, and then finally, I will say a little bit about uh, some of the political implications of the argument uh, for the finance sector. So let me start with um, lay theories of value, um, which, which helps us to get to what I think value is. Um, 
you know, the commodity economy and the, and the, the economy of financial assets can only function if potential purchasers of their products believe that they have value. And value in that sense is simply what something is worth. Um, and each individual or corporate potential purchaser or seller forms their own view of what something is worth. And that sort of in that sense is quite subjective. It's not an objective fact. But but despite that, value is also socially constructed because our judgments about what something is worth depend on shared beliefs about how we should make those judgments. Those shared beliefs are a kind of norm. You know, what standards should we apply in judging the value of things? And there's a whole bunch of them, and I call them lay theories of value. Um, theories that we all use in everyday life to determine how we value things. Um, and you know, theories are used in more um, specialized settings like the finance sector to decide how to value things. The concept overlaps quite a bit with the idea of a valuation convention that we find in the French um, heterodox economics of conventions. Um, let me give you a very simple example. The price of something should be lower if it's damaged. That's a very simple theory of value, um, which uh, many of us use when we're evaluating the value of something we might want to buy. Um, although obviously it interacts with other theories of value when we're deciding what something is worth. Or we can look at um, a more complex, but actually outdated example, uh, which is the idea that the price of a financial option should be calculated using the Black Schools formula which you know, those of you with interest in the finance sector will be familiar with. Um, there are many, many, many thousands of these lay theories of value. Some of them are quite general, like the damaged one, and some of them are very specialized, like the Black Schools one. And my argument is that the social actors that I call value entrepreneurs constantly seek to persuade us to adopt particular theories of value and apply them to particular items, often the ones that they're trying to sell. Um, so there's a kind of politics of valuation dominated by actors with the discursive power to influence what we think about these questions, such as advertisers, marketing departments, and media operators. Um, and perhaps the most obvious one, all these value entrepreneurs are the people who are devoted to talking up the value of luxury goods like Rolex watches. There are some other examples on the slide, but I don't really have time to go into them all. Um, because I want to move on and say that very similar processes are at work in the finance sector, uh, which is the main focus of the second half of the book. You know, the question there is, why do investors pay the prices that they do for particular financial assets, shares in particular companies or mortgage-backed securities or cryptocurrencies? Uh, of the three that I look at specifically. And the answer is not, not that they base those valuations on solid evidence of um, future earnings streams as conventional financial economics suggests, because there is no such solid evidence except for a small minority of assets like government bonds. No, instead, they too are persuaded by value entrepreneurs to adopt particular theories of value and use them to value particular financial assets. So, for example, during the internet bubble at the turn of the century, many investors were persuaded to value internet firms on the basis of how many visitors they could attract to their websites. That was a valuation convention or a lay theory of value that collapsed rather spectacularly when the internet bubble burst in 2001. Now, so the lay theories of value is the first of the concepts I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the second one is the idea of asset circles, which comes into the story when we start to look at financial assets. And the core of the argument here is that the value of financial assets depends on there being groups of people who are persuaded by the relevant lay theories of value that the asset class concerned is worth investing in. You know, there's no asset unless you can sell it, and there's no possibility of selling it unless there are people who are interested in buying it. Um, 
I call these groups of people asset circles, and every asset must have such a group, and the success of the asset, the capacity of the financial um, value entrepreneur to drive up its price, amongst other things, depends on the size of that asset circle. So financial value entrepreneurs, as well as advocating particular areas of financial value, must also work to build up the asset circles for the assets they are peddling. Um, something that takes us way outside the scope of neoclassical economics, incidentally. Um, and the later chapters of the book trace that process for three very different types of assets. And then venture capital backed shares, which I'll talk about a little more in a moment, the cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and structured subprime securities, which were behind the, the financial crash in 2008. So I'm only going to touch on one of those, given time issues. Um, so let me say a little bit about the venture capital. Venture capitalists make money by taking investments from institutions like pension funds, um, sovereign wealth funds, wealthy individuals, and then using that money to buy stakes in a portfolio of small private companies. They then try to grow those companies and then sell on their stake in the company at a profit. Um, in some of the most successful cases, they managed to sell that stake by launching the company's shares on the stock exchange in what's known as an IPO, an initial public offering, IPO. And we can see each stage of that process as a step towards growing the asset circle for the shares of that portfolio company. You know, at the first stage, the company itself pitches to the, to the venture capitalist and they offer a value narrative in the form of a business plan to try and persuade the VC that it's worth buying into their company. And then in later funding rounds, the first venture capitalist typically pitches to other venture capitalists to, to draw them in, to take a share of the funding load. And then when it's time to launch this share onto the, the stock, onto the public stock exchange, the venture capitalist engages underwriters from the big investment banks who draft a prospectus and hawk it around institutional investors to persuade them that they should buy shares in this company when it's launched. And finally, at the IPO itself, those shares are made available to private investors and they are brought into the asset circle through the work of people like stock analysts and the financial media. So we've got a process of gradually expanding the asset circle, which is an essential part of the process of expanding the price that can be achieved when it's time to sell the venture capitalists stay. Um, so one of the lessons of the book is that, that value is, is socially constructed. It depends on these narratives about it, these lay theories of value, but it's not constructed. It's not constructed in some kind of anonymous sense by abstract, discursive, linguistic forces. Social construction is a, an actively pursued process, you know, which is driven by the self-interested actions of powerful economic actors. I also spend a bit of time talking about you know, causal explanations and, and issues around that. But but let me close today by focusing on. Um, the more political implications of the argument for the finance sector in particular. This is what I was supposed to give you the next slide. So the politics of financial value is currently dominated by, by two issues. Now, the first is the enormous power of the finance sector and its capacity not only to invent assets and inflate their values, but also to shape government policies in its interests. And then second, we have the neoclassical market discourse of mainstream economics that's used to legitimize favoring the finance sector by treating them, the incomes it generates as a measure of its social value, including them in GDP, for example. There are many reasons to question that neoclassical discourse already in the literature, but the book provides another one by showing that the values achieved from financial assets don't reflect their contributions to productive investment, but rather they're the product of work done, narrative, discursive work done by value entrepreneurs to market those assets 
and push whatever theories of their values serve their own interests. And the consequence is that those financial assets suck in vast amounts of capital that could otherwise be used for far more socially useful purposes. So I conclude then that, that we need a radically different financial system. Um, a financial system that isn't driven by you know, the inflation of values to serve the interests of, of value entrepreneurs, but instead that starts from ethical decisions about what we want out of our economy. You know, things perhaps like ending global poverty or halting the climate disaster or both. Um, and then we have to shift our economy, including the finance sector, in the directions required to achieve that. And one consequence surely would be to heavily restrict financial innovation and, and roll back those innovations, like those that brought about the 2008 financial crisis that clearly serve the issues of financial institutions and, and not everyone else's. That leads to a requirement for a vast amount of work in order to develop plausible plans for what a reformed finance might look like uh, and indeed how to overcome the enormous political and transitional challenges that kind of program uh, would raise. But I think it's clear that it's not only the theory of value and the theory of financial value that we need to reinvent, we need to reinvent the finance sector itself. I'll stop there, thank you. I have two um, commentators. The first is uh, Dr. Angela Martinez D, who is a senior lecturer in the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Longborough University. Uh, she completed her first degree in creative writing and mathematics at the University of Washington and took an MSc and PhD at Nottingham University Business School, where her PhD research emphasized digital enterprise and intersectionality. Her interest in entrepreneurship stems from her experience of building grassroots arts organizations in her hometown of Seattle, where she was co-founder and program director for Youth Speak Seattle, the area's leading creative writing and performing arts education organization for young people, and she remains active in this sphere. Her many publications include Gender Theory Nonconforming, Critical Realist Feminism, Trans Politics and Affordance Theory, Building the Anti-Racist Classroom, How the Collective Makes the Radical Possible, Reflections on the COVID-19 Rupture Towards Transformation, and The Business School is Racist, Act Up. Angela, it's a real pleasure to have you here. As a critical scholar of entrepreneurship and technoculture who takes an intersectional feminist critical realist approach to understanding the world, I was genuinely excited when I read the abstract of Inventing Value and saw it would soon be published. In recent years, I've opened the large entrepreneurship module I teach to postgrads at Loughborough University with an extended lecture on the concept of value, something I felt was missing from my own postgraduate education. This lecture has, till now, been organized into three sections, the so-called objectivist and subjectivist approaches, the Marxist approach, and the critical feminist and eco-feminist theories. Inventing Value was precisely the book I didn't know I needed, in order to cast a critical, parenthetical, realist eye on much of this body of literature. Reorganize my understanding of these theories into the marginalist and Marxist perspectives, and to bring into the classroom a more ontologically sound, sociologically informed notion of how societies construct values through intersubjective cultures and conventions of valuation. Dave's extension in this book of his previously theorized concept of norm circles, which I love and use all the time, to the notions of monetary and asset circles is characteristically clear, logical, and convincing, as well as it is novel. His synthesis and critique of economic perspectives on value dominant for nearly 200 years, as well as key elements of more contemporary pragmatist literature, constitutes an important and timely conceptual advancement and a much needed challenge to the mythos of rationality that dominates discussions of economic activity. And yet, however, he's very humble about it. Um, the stripping back of pervasive myths around the topics of value, money, and assets is, I think, one of the great strengths of this work. It may be no surprise that I'm particularly enthusiastic about Dave's introduction of the notion of the value entrepreneur or the individuals and groups whose objective it is to persuade others of a specific asset's value. I am equally buoyed by the links he makes between this process and concentrations of power and resources, a component that is so often missing from scholarship on the world of business and management. 
In this way, the first half of inventing value offers some core concepts and connections with which to explore the notion of value in the contemporary digital economy. He generously models this for us in the second half, where he applies these concepts to venture capital, unicorn companies, and Bitcoin, all of which are favorite topics for my entrepreneurship students, as well as to subprime securities, a case which usefully illuminates some of the dynamics of the 21st century macroeconomy. Dave theorizes how the stories that powerful value entrepreneurs tell about these assets become causally efficacious, challenging their taken for grantedness through exposing their social construction. Through the ontological picture it builds, the book also offers a basis for a compelling critique of the class politics at play in each of these empirical applications. As I was reading, I found interesting parallels and space for symbiosis with the work of scholars of race and decoloniality, such as Sylvia Winter, whose attention to the role of myth-making in the creation of first religious, then rational economic man as the quintessential human subject, underpins her critique of Eurocentricity and Black dehumanization. And the late Charles Mills, who in his book, The Racial Contract, argues that differential assignations of value on the basis of race, itself a social construction, permeate all social institutions. Such assignations produce, using the terms introduced in Dave's book, lay theories of racial value, both tacit and codified, upon which Mills holds the Rawlsian social contract relies. Thus, for me, Inventing Value is not only a book I am already recommending to my entrepreneurship students and colleagues, but holds a range of potential applications for my work as an anti-racist feminist. Its framing of value itself as a social relation can be a springboard for further and deeper analyses of social structures of power. I have two perhaps interconnected questions for discussion. While the book does take quite an explanatory approach to value, the idea of ethics and oughtness does come up quite a bit. So I'm keen to hear Dave's thinking on what ought to be the case on a couple of things. First, I wanna bring in the eco-feminist stance that earthly resources that sustain life on the planet, like clean air and clean water have inherent value. And to ask Dave to consider this position in light of the book's arguments. Dave, you assert that the, the value of a thing is the price it ought to exchange at with the caveat that this is of course subjective, but should a thing's relevance to sustaining life on earth have any bearing on the price it ought to exchange at? Um, to be clear, I'm not asking you to solve uh, the diamond water paradox in a new way. I'm just curious to hear your reflections. And then my second question stems from your discussion of Mazzucato's work. Through her argument that we should be aiming to maximize social benefit with the economic choices we make, she centers the importance of ethical questions in steering our economic decisions. So when it comes to making those decisions, I'd like to ask how you think we ought to evaluate the range of potential actions we could take. Finally, I would just like to congratulate and thank you, Dave, for writing this book, which I know I will come back to again and again. Thank you, Angela, that was great. Um... Next is Jamie Morgan, who is a professor of economics at Leeds Beckett University, uh, where he lectures in the subject area of economics, analytics, and international business. He teaches and publishes in the fields of economics, political economy, philosophy, sociology, and international politics. Jamie co-edits a leading heterodox economics journal, The Real World Economics Review, with Edward Fulbrook and is the former coordinator of the Association for Heterodox Economists. His recent edited books include The Inequality Crisis in 2020, Post-Neoliberal Economics 2021, and Economics and Climate Emergency in 2022. Recent articles include Electric Vehicles, The Future We Made and the Problem of Unmaking It, Teaching Climate Complacency, Mainstream Economics Textbooks and the Need for Transformation in Economics Education, Systemat systemic stablecoin and the defense case for central bank digital currency, a critique of the Bank of England's framing, and will we work in 21st century capitalism, a critique of the fourth industrial revolution literature. Jamie, many thanks for being here. Well, I don't have questions that are quite as good as the ones you just got, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. I I'm known Dave for a long time, and I would imagine I'd say this is probably his best book of all the ones he's produced so far. It's exactly as Chris described it, particularly chapters four and five, they're very good. 
in terms of um, talking about it now, though, I mean, it, it's hard to know how to uh, approach this in the sense that um, you've only got like five or six minutes to talk about a book that nobody who's listening to this will have read yet, because the whole point of this is a book launch. So you can't really go into any particular detail about a book that I actually reviewed <laughs> and then produce, you know, kind of a minute based detailed, you know, discussion of it. That doesn't seem the point of this. The whole point of this is to kind of give people encouragement to go out and actually read the book and make their own minds up about it. But So on that basis, possibly the best thing to do is to ask Dave to answer two questions. The first one I've just put directly into the chat. The short version of that is essentially, what would the longer version of this book look like? Right, now, that sounds like a banal question, but it, it's not particularly banal when you think about the way in which, say, chapter two, so that's page 18 to 41, so roughly 20 pages or so. And as Chris pointed out earlier, on, this disposes of labor theory of value, mainstream economic price formation, and also the quite influential work subsequent to any of those kind of things by Mazzucato on, you know, on wealth um, creation and wealth extraction and similar ideas. So all of that is disposed of quite quickly and concisely in, in a kind of summary version, because, you know, that, that's not the kind of focus of Dave's work. Dave's much more interested in things which develop on from his own kind of work in social ontology, looking at issues in terms of an agent structure process, in terms of looking at the world in terms of social causation, and then his own kind of concept of norm circles, in this case applied to the finance sector in terms of asset circles, asset complexes, and then entrepreneurs of valuation and those kind of things. Yeah. So he's kind of taken his own work and developed on from it using a kind of broad range of relevant literature for that, which comes from particular areas that look in terms of anthropology and other things about conventions of value and all of those. So it's, it's quite a different way of looking, a very interesting one, because you don't really get that kind of thing done in economics usually. And, you know, and as Angela said, it's not the kind of thing you read much about these kind of things. So you know, very worth reading for those kind of reasons. But equally, you know, you you dispose of a mass of work very, very quickly based on what for all purposes is quite a concise argument about them. But I would imagine it's something that will also create something of um, an impediment for some kind of readers. You know, they'll be expecting certain things of a book of this kind and it just kind of summarily deals with those. And we'll leave them with a lot of questions, I should imagine. So what would the longer version of this look like? Particularly given that, say, for example, we're both from, you know, scientific realism, broadly critical realism. So we share and agree on a lot of things, don't we? You know, obviously, we also disagree fairly vehemently about some minor things, which is a good example of why, you know, philosophers will never rule the world. And Plato is very wrong about the Republic. You know, if you put philosophers in charge of anything, nothing would ever get done. Just have to come along to Tony Lawson's uh, Cambridge Social Ontology Group on a Tuesday to realise nothing ever gets answered. Although there's lots of interesting discussion about stuff. So what would the longer version of this book like that actually address those issues, particularly since a lot of the arguments that you make about, you know, labour theory of value, they're embedded, aren't they? I mean, if you consider that the vast mass of material that's done on things like, say, Marx and economics, you know, and then mainstream economics itself, you know, there is a huge amount of material there, some of which possibly could be more sympathetically dealt with possible. All right. So first question. A second question, really, is to what degree I asset complexes indicative of a finance system and what would be the nature of a finance system and, and does the material that you put in the, the kind of subsequent three chapters actually illustrate that kind of material and then again there's a lot to that as a question when you start to unpack what's involved i mean you've written a book called inventing value i mean if you were to write another book to go along with it a complementary book it would be something along the lines of you know, inventing debt dependence and desperation, because any kind of empirical kind of argument about the nature of the economies we live in, the finance system writ large, is about a system of private debt creation and debt dependence, which also has fundamental effects on the nature of the whole of the economy and society, you know. So if you break it down and start thinking, well, I'll build upwards from something like, say, a version of norm circles and agent structure argument, 
and then define that in terms of asset creations through various valuation processes and then price formation, however you want to define those kind of things. To what degree does that generate a system? And to what degree does the system then have kind of quantified relationships within it, which have necessary relations that follow in particular ways, irrespective of the decisions or beliefs or norms of the people within it? You know, I'm, so possibly what I'm suggesting there is there may be more involved there than just saying some people are more powerful than others. In some senses, we, you all become embedded and trapped in the momentum and tendencies of the system that's created as an emergent ca capacities built out of the individual components of that system. I mean, to what degree do you have that kind of thinking as part of the way you've thought about this? OK, that's all I've got to say. Let me um, try and get my head around the best way to, to, to respond to, to, to those, those comments. I mean, the first thing I must say is, is, is thank you. Thank you for your kind words um, about this book. Um, you know, it's, it's very gratifying to have people value the book um, because, you know, a lot of work goes into these things and uh, you never quite know how it's going to be received. Um, and it's great to have such a positive reception here. Um, but obviously you want me to answer some questions. Um, and there's several quite big complicated questions there. I don't want to kind of monopolize the discussion. So maybe I'll be a little bit selective about um, how I pick off a bit to say something about. Um, so starting with, with Angela, um, I think maybe the question about um, Mazzucato and how should we uh, evaluate uh, economic decisions. Um, and as, as you say, the book is more focused on you know, explaining valuations rather than with ethical sections, but the place that I kind of touch more on the ethical issues is indeed in that conversation about um, Mazzucato's fascinating recent book, The Value of Everything, which, which Jamie also mentioned. Um, she has a bit of a, a split view of value. Sometimes she talks about it in terms that seem to be derived from Marx's labor theory. Um, so this is when Jamie talks about wealth creation and wealth extraction. She talks about value creation and value extraction. Uh, I don't think that really works for the same reasons it doesn't work for Marx. Um, but then I think her second angle on value is much more important. That's the idea that we ought to make decisions about what happens in the economy on the basis of what I would call the social value of alternative decisions. Um, so let me illustrate those points as an example, um, which is in the book. Um, let's say that you know, some group of people or organization has produced a pile of bricks. Now, the social value of that pile of bricks for me is, is, is the contribution it makes to flourishing. And this is starting towards an answer to your questions, your other question, Angela. Um, the social value of the pile of bricks doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how much labor went into producing it or how much they cost or any of those things. The social value of the pile of bricks depends on what we use them for. You know, if we build lots of flats for low-income families, then the pile of bricks has a much greater social value than it would if we used it to build a mansion for a billionaire. Um, and so I'm making an ethical judgment. And I think ethical judgments are, are really important to these kinds of decisions. And, and one of the problems with both uh, Marxist and uh, mainstream approaches to the economy is that they, they can't deny that they're talking about ethical questions. Actually, they are. You know, uh, both of them are covertly um, ethical systems. But by denying that, they kind of obscure the ethical judgments that are being relied upon in those systems. Um, well, I think we need to be more explicit about those ethical questions. And, and that, of course, brings me to um, your question, Angela, about the, the, the value of your of resources. Shouldn't we value things in terms of what they can um, provide for, in terms of preserving life on Earth? Um, I'm sure that's absolutely one part of what we should value. I think that, you know, in the ideal system, and which we're obviously an awful long way away from, um, these questions about ethical valuation um, need to be decided 
in a kind of open democratic way, an inclusive democratic way. Um, and I've talked about this in terms of um, Habermas's um, discursive democracy, for example. And so rather than me say, well, exactly, what is the basis on which we should make ethical judgments? I'd say, well, we, we should involve people in making those decisions about you know, what is best for society. And, and we should make sure that everyone is listened to, or every, every, every point of view is listened to, and, and in particular, the points of view of those people that are usually excluded from this kind of decision making. So um, should we value things in terms of their contribution to, to life on Earth? Well. Well, I, I think we should, and I'm sure that, that anyone thinking um, coherently about this question would say yes, but but that's primarily because the, our future flourishing as a species depends on the capacity of Earth um, to support life. But let me stop there in terms of answering Angela, because I'm probably going on a bit more than I should already. Um, and say a bit about um, Jamie's questions um those are very big very big questions and the first one about you know what's missing if you like in terms of this book you know could it should it be bigger um i'm i'm conscious that i go over what i think's wrong with the neoclassical and marxist traditions in particular very quickly but, but there was a reason for that, and that is that you know, there's a huge literature about what's wrong with those traditions already, and my objective wasn't to replicate that or, um, or you know, contribute to debates within those, those traditions. What I wanted to do was to say enough to make clear why I was dismissing them before I went on to the more constructive parts of the book. And yes, you're right, much more could be said about both traditions. I, actually, I say much more about the Marxist tradition. In fact, and there's a whole chapter about it in my previous book. Um, and and so, yes, there could be more to be said. What would the 600 word, word page look like? I mean, it would look less readable, I think, is the answer. I, I, I hate long books. I, I mean, I, I know that it's... Um, you know, 600 word, 600 word, 600 page books, um, arguably have more substance in them than 200 and whatever pages this is. Um, but does anybody ever read them? I, okay, Jenny, I know you probably do. Um, but most of us, I think, struggle to, to get through uh, something like that. And then your other question, I, I, I'm, I'm aware I probably haven't answered your first question very well, but, but the, the second question was, um, about systemic structures, the emergence of systemic structures, which then feed back onto what's happening in the economy. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely an important point. Um, it's certainly um, coherent with the, the kind of approach I have, but I haven't paid a lot of attention to that specific issue here. Um, I think there's 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 much more to be said about it. You're right, and, it, and, and I agree with your your desire to have more said, but but it's not really a focus of the, this particular bit. Tom Lines um, is asked the following: Dave says financial institutions use their economic, political, and discursive power to inflate the value of financial assets. I have no doubt that is true. It has long seemed to me to be self-evident that all market values are determined by the relative degrees of market power of a market's participants, and that conventional value theorists theories are merely a set of devices to obscure this. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm very sympathetic to the, the, the power part of that, that equation. Um, I'm less sympathetic to the market part of it. I mean, it's not something I've written much about, but but I think the concept of a market is is very overrated. Um, I think that market talk, and, and this is another you know discursive an example of discursive power, isn't it? The market talk is absolutely pervasive in talk about the economy. Um, 
And the consequence of that is that there's a kind of presumption that the neoclassical logic of the market applies to what's happening in the economy. But I don't think that most of the economy works very much like the neoclassical model of the market. And, and I think that is obscured by this predominance of market talk um, in discussion of the economy. So power, absolutely, you know, the outcomes in commodity transactions depend a lot on relative power. Um, and the, the one of the things that I've tried to do in the book is to, to look at how discursive power in particular has a significant influence on the outcome of these commodity transactions. Um, and certainly I, I, I say, I talk a little bit about other kinds of power and, and how those have an effect. Um, I just wouldn't trace it quite as market power. Thank you, Dave. Next question is from Ifoma Dan Ogosi. Are there other forms of value we can observe in communities? For example, individuals and in communities feeling valued for being entrusted with money to deliver interventions? Hmm, interesting question. I mean, I, and certainly, you know, the book is talking 90% you know, about value in the sense of you know, what monetary value we attach to a commodity or an asset. Um, but that doesn't mean that other kinds of value aren't important, it's just that's not the focus of the, of the work. And, and, and there are many other kinds of value. You know, there's, you know, I've spoken a little bit about ethics and social value. Um, you know, there's aesthetic value. There's just you know, numerical values. Um, value means a lot of different things. And many of those other kinds of value are equally important, maybe even more important in some way. Um, and so the particular variety you're talking about is, you know, people feeling valued. Um, that's absolutely important to, to human flourishing. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, the kind of sorts of cases are that are lying behind your question, though. So it's difficult for me to say anymore. Dave, I think your answer is yes. To okay. yes. Well, because they, well, you have this concept of asset circles that could theoretically be used to uh, valorize non-commercial assets, right? And, and this is, I mean, this is a a lot of ISR fellows have been working on community organizations and the way they basically had to replace the state and the providing of a whole bunch of services, mm -hmm. and then the way that the community, although it's a struggle, ends up valuing that and allowing the mutual valuation yeah. to support yeah. the work. Okay, that's great. And and by the I way, think that, your work can really apply in a lot of different directions. Right? And that that reminds me of one thing I should have said earlier, which is that I loved Angela's suggestion that this could be expanded into other areas and we could talk about lay theories of racial value, for example, mm. um, which I think is another example of that thinking a bit more widely with the with these tools. Angela, do you want to comment on that? You don't have to. Just just, just that I, I could just see how, um, yeah, you could get more specific with different um, kind of facets or phenomena um, and that the tools could be applied in, in a lot of different directions. Um, very obviously for me, I wanted to, um, think about what happens when humans are differentially <laughs> valued. That's kind of where I ended up and how I got to that right. um, point. So, um, but also, um, Chris, you had some interesting applications to, to the case of, of Twitter and, and Elon. And um, so I could really see how, um, um, you know, there's a lot of ability to, tra to transfer some of these concepts to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question is from Emanuele Lobina. Thanks, Dave, for a nice glimpse into your important work. My question is about the definition of economic value. You seem to define economic value as a relational and subjective projection of worth. Do you think that there is any merit in defining economic value and perhaps social value as a coordinating device for the social acceptance of alternative courses of action? 
Yeah, uh, okay, yes, thank you. Um, I think there's a question, there's a difference between definitions and and theories or, or arguments that employ the same terms. I mean, I think, um, you know, I define economic value as what, what the people concerned think that something is worth. Um, as you say, I think that's entirely compatible with saying that, that economic values does function as a coordinating device. I mean, that, that that's absolutely clear. I mean, apart from anything else, it's involved in um, facilitating transactions in which people, some people get what they want, and then the other people on the other side, in theory, get what they want out of the same transaction. You know, that, that's absolutely social coordination, isn't it? Um, so value is, is quite fundamental to that. It's absolutely a coordinating device. Um, I just wouldn't define it as a coordinating device. I think that's a kind of a consequence of how it operates, if you see what I mean. Thanks, Dave. Next question is from Steve Ash. Thank you, Dave. That was really interesting. I want to ask about how the distinction between use value and exchange value applies to asset circles. The examples you've used in your presentation were things with exchange value. So how does asset circle consider use value, specifically things that meet basic human needs such as food or shelter, where the asset circle could be considered to be all of humanity? Yes, I mean, I really only use the concept of asset circles when I'm, I'm talking about financial assets, um, because I think the considerations involved in, in you know, buying and selling financial assets are different than the, the considerations involved in, in buying and selling ordinary goods and services. Um, you know, ordinary goods and services aren't bought as assets. They're not bought in order to get some future income from them. They're bought because of their use value. And, and, and so the thing about financial assets is they don't really have use value. Um, I mean, some people say, oh, yes, well, you know, the use value is you know, my security in later life or whatever. But, but, you know, that's a very derivative kind of conception of use value. You know, use value is being able to eat something or, or wear it or, or whatever. Um, and so there's, there's a definite distinction here between things with use value and things that have asset circles for them. Um, so probably you would need some other kind of concept uh, if you wanted to, to think about how things that meet basic human needs kind of influence our valuations of them. So, uh, and maybe just the lay theories of value side is, is, is enough for that without the asset circles. It seems to me that asset circles are more frequently required when the potential use value of the item is less obvious. Um, if the use is very clear or already typical, then the construction of an asset circle could happen almost immediately because everybody's got the right lay theories of value to apply to that item. Um, it becomes almost, um, it goes without saying what that item should be used for and thus what its potential lay value could be. Um, and I think that the further away you get from those items that are very necessary for survival, the more important it becomes in this process for asset circles to be constructed. I don't know if you've you've set up that mm -hmm. kind of dynamic in the in the argument, Dave, but that's something that I am seeing through. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Angela. Next question is from Thomas uh, Salman. And we apologize for drastically shortening this very interesting question. Uh, in regards to reinventing finance, what's your take on, for example, the rise of environmental, social, and governance finance, ESG? Would this fit into the argument you are making? And then secondly, in the current context, in order to reinvent value, don't we have to also reconsider the issue of debt? For example, as one moves from global finance centers to the global periphery, state control over money is limited by the respective position within the hierarchy of the international monetary system. So there's ESG and then there's debt. It's two different questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little cynical about ESG. I mean, I think it's um, kind of papering over the existing system. I, and, you know, I, 
obviously it's it's a good thing if firms are are encouraged to do things that are better for the environment and, and have a bit more social responsibility. But I don't see it as a fundamental reform of finance. Um, you know, it's something that has been rapidly accommodated within the existing financial system. You know, you can buy ESG investment funds, for example. Um, and it's quite remarkable what some of these funds invest in. <laughs> You can you they can they can buy stocks and tobacco companies because they they have good corporate governance, for example. Or uh, so there's um and I'm, I'm not suggesting that ESG is an example of uh, a sort of major reform of the finance sector. I, I think I I don't know what the right answers are for the finance sector. I think that a huge amount of work is required on that. It's, it's one of the things I'd like to get more involved in, um, following on from this book and, and the one I'm working on at the moment. Um, and, and if people have ideas on that, I'd be interested um, in the, what they are. But I think that much more radical change than that is needed in the finance sector. You know, you know, for the sort of scale of things I'm thinking of is like, you know, abolish derivatives trading, for example. Um, you know, I don't know if that's entirely feasible, but I think it might be quite a major step forward in terms of you know eliminating a, a socially useless element of the finance sector, um, which skims off um, money from the rest of us. Uh, also, yeah, you're just you're further wetting our appetite with these answers, Dave. <laughs> Here's the next question. Uh, it's from Lee Caldwell. Do you believe that in the majority of cases, at least, there is a ground truth about value, which is either manipulated or suspended by the entrepreneurs you describe? Or is it your position that there is rarely any true value and everything is emergent or created? Of course, there are clearly things like NFTs with no underlying objective <laughs> value. But putting those special cases aside, you know, what would you say about other sort of more normal objects and okay. services yeah good question and i and, and i think this one i can answer is the opposite of the other one um <laughs> no <laughs> um, i don't think there's any ground truth about value uh, at least not in the sense of monetary well, probably not in any sense actually but in the sense of monetary value money itself is a social construction um and there's no ground truth about what it is worth in terms of money it's <clears throat> entirely a product of you know, a long, complicated social process, and in that social process, many different causal factors interact, including questions of what theories of value the participants have adopted and how they apply them to that particular object. Um, and there's no kind of natural point where those processes should end up it's, you know, they end up where they end up and, and there's a causal story behind that there's no ground truth about it for me. yeah i mean one of the things i liked about your argument is the is tying social construction to causal causal sources of value so we can over a period of time identify sources of value and in a way, there's kind of a moving ground truth, but it isn't inherent in the object. And it's it's enormously complex to actually calculate all that out. And then it's mixed in with the ethical arguments that you seem to see are as primary or prior as something that we should have serious reflection on as part of the valuation process. So, and not just looking at the judgments of asset circles that are clearly created for a, you know, kind of a a self-interested project. So anyway, I, I don't know. I think that the longer arc of the book helps, you know, clarify the how your what your positions are on that. Um, sorry, I'm just very engaged in this. Okay, anonymous attendee, what is the relevance of your ethical approach to value entrepreneurs um, in, in relation to a sociology of crime, the study, if it were to exist, of collusion and corruption? In other words, where is the place of value entrepreneurship in a reformed economy and society? And I guess in relation to crime in particular. Mm -hmm. Interesting question. 
<laughs> sorry, probably just the same. Um, yeah. I mean, crime is socially constructed as well, isn't it? So, you know, it's, you know, does the collusion of two value entrepreneurs in, in progressing a particular agenda count as crime or not? Well, that depends on what the law says. Um, and the law, of course, is something which is um, heavily influenced by the sorts of people who become value entrepreneurs because of the, the political influence that they have. Um, so marking something as crime is, is a part of a particular set of social structures. Um, should we, I suppose, is the next logical question, should we say that collusion in, in generating value narratives is criminal or corrupt? And I don't think it, it, it is inherently. Um, I think the question is, what are the consequences in particular cases? Um, and I think there will probably always be value entrepreneurship. There will always be people trying to persuade us that you know this is how we should value something. And and maybe sometimes when they're trying to do that, the the arguments they're making are perfectly reasonable. Like you know you should pay less for something if it's damaged. You know that's not a not a horrible theory of value. It's quite a sort of sensible theory of value. Um, and I'm sure there are plenty of other sensible theories of value. So I don't think value entrepreneurship as such is a problem. It's a question of, of how it gets used in some cases. We can't hear you, Chris. Our next question is from Jack Newman. Do you think we need to start placing a financial value on a wider range of things? nature, ecosystems, unpaid care, social infrastructure, and so on. This might mean that when politicians focus on GDP growth, they will take these things into account, or should we instead push back against the financialization of these social goods altogether? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yes and yes, yes. I kind of agree with both, both horns of the dilemma, <laughs> if I'm allowed to do that. Um, Yes, I mean, I want one of the, the themes of my previous book, when I waved at you earlier, here we are, here we are, is that um, there are enormously important parts of the economy that, that don't operate on the basis of um, commodity value. Um, and those parts of the economy need to be treated as economic and given the kind of, you know, treated in policy terms as being as desirable as the things that are already counted as economic at the moment, the things that you know, earn money from selling um, selling things. So bringing those things into our understanding of something like GDP is absolutely desirable, but, but, but if we can do that without attaching financial values to them, which it, it seems quite a contradiction, then, then that would be far better because the thing that's valuable about unpaid care, for example, is not that it could be paid at fifteen pounds an hour. You know that's not what matters about it. What matters about it is the contribution it makes to to a person's flourishing. Um, and so I'm very reluctant to say we should attach financial values to those sorts of things. We should find ways of valuing them and value them, you know, in policy terms without necessarily putting monetary value on them. That would be my preferred way forward. Although if you want to know how to do that, then I'll have to pass that question on to someone else. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Dave. Ali Caldwell is back. Um, here's the question. If there are value entrepreneurs who are trying to increase the value of an asset, it seems likely that there would be others who want to reduce it. Who wins? Is it just the loudest or the biggest number, you know, the biggest number of Twitter followers, for example, who gets to dictate the answer? Or does the debate between long and short entrepreneurs help to drive the resulting value to some kind of more accurate consensus? Mm, yeah, that was another really interesting question. Um, 
I, I sort of have trouble with the more accurate consensus part of this, but but I think that the idea that there are people with conflicting approaches is absolutely part of the story. Um, I mean, one of the things that I do in the chapter by Bitcoin is I talk about uh, the fact that there's this whole series of discourses that's been developed by the Bitcoin community, um, which attempt to justify placing a higher value on Bitcoin. But alongside that, there's a whole other series of Bitcoin of discourses about Bitcoin that have been developed by critics of Bitcoin, which are designed to undermine the idea that Bitcoin has value. So you know you have. Um, Joseph Stiglitz, I think, actually said that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. Um, and of course it doesn't, but then, but then neither do the shares of Apple. Um, um, it seems to be quite blinkered about that. I'm not trying to make the case for Bitcoin in particular, but um, just the point that there are you know, in many spaces, and that's a, one of the really striking examples, um, people who are advancing theories that are intended to raise the value of something and at the same time people are advancing theories that are intended to lower the value of something or deny the value of something altogether um, and the outcome of that um, is the result of a very long complicated causal process um, probably the the route that that passes through is is primarily the asset circle routes so what is the consequence of these sets of discourses in terms of how many people actually think that it would be a good idea to buy Bitcoin? And that's a process where you know, the, the people shouting no intrinsic value, you know, they might persuade a lot of potential investors not to buy Bitcoin, but there might still be you know, all these other investors over here who decide to invest in it anyway because they're persuaded by other discourses of Bitcoin's value. So the question is not who's loudest or the biggest number. The question is how many people are persuaded or how many investors with how much you know, investable funds at their disposal are persuaded to join the assets. So, yeah, we can't hear you again, Chris. Um, there's a question about uh, your feelings about the Tevin Owen Boltonsky book that mm -hmm. you discuss in your book. Um, yeah. Uh, the person that gets the feeling that you agree with the, the their ideas, but could you elaborate a bit on that? Because they're, they're not entirely sure whether that's true or not. Yeah. On judgment this is justification. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, Boltanski and Teveno are, are um, I mean, they're sociologists, um, although Teveno, I think, actually is, is well, Boltanski is a sociologist. Teveno is from the French economics of convention tradition. Um, so that he's very much in that sort of tradition that I'm drawing on um, when I use convention theory. Um, but the, the Boltanski version of it, um, takes it in a different direction than I have. You know, if you, if I'm talking about lay theories of value, which are kind of roughly equivalent to conventions, evaluation conventions in that tradition. And I'm saying, you know, there are thousands of these things. When you make a decision about the value of X, you might well take into account you know, three or four different theories of value. And the person on the other side might take, might take account of of three or four theories of value, some of which might be the same as yours and some of which aren't. And in every transaction, there might be a different mix of those things operating. Um, whereas the Boltanski book takes it in the direction of, you know, there are seven cities, I think he calls them, um, each of which is a kind of, um, normative regime for making <clears throat> judgments which works in one particular area of social life um so my conventions are very little and and then multiply endlessly and 
And his conventions are very large, and there's seven of them. Um, so th there are strong parallels, but they're also quite significant differences. Um, Dave, I have a question about public uptake. You know, in the in a later comment, Ifoma came back with a comment about participatory budgeting, and I have some experience of doing planning and budget in my my uh, university in California, where it's, it was extremely difficult to get my colleagues it, to be interested in this. I mean, I think it's a vital and fascinating thing to study the spreadsheets of how universities misallocate their resources on you know in unfair ways. I am a, like a, a, in a tiny minority of very well educated people are interested in this. So I'm asking this question myself as well as to you. I don't want to really want to just put you on the spot, but how do how do we make um, in addition to writing very clear, accessible books like yours, people more interested in kind of a struggle over valuation? You know, where the autumn statement responds to the a legitimation crisis in the government's relationship to the markets. And so they have to do austerity and you know reduce uh, debt, state debt over a period of years, et cetera, in the traditional way. How do we get involved in countering that in a way that doesn't make people just feel hopeless? Is there anything that you know starting in communities? Is there some other kind of discourse? What do we do? That, that's a great question, and 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 I, I the only answer I could give you would be. You know, get involved with political campaigning. Um, I mean, I think one get of the involved in I your planning and budget council. <laughs> 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 I must have said that a hundred thousand times. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think one of the big issues for me is that it's all very well for us as academics to write critiques of how the, the world is working, but, but what is the kind of possibility of there being some kind of transmission belt from that critique to actually making a change? And that that is a massive, massive problem. And, and it's a massive problem partly because um, you know, progressive political forces are so weak mm. uh, at the moment. And you know, the problem of that conveyor belt from critique to useful action can only pass through those passive, those progressive political forces. And, you know, so it's a, very, it's a much, much bigger problem than, you know, what is valued. Yeah, you know, actually, as you were talking, I just remembered something that's happened here in the UK in the last few months that really does give me hope, which is the railway unions public explanations of why they're striking, which I have found incredibly succinct and powerful. You know, there's the the union leader whose name I'm blocking at the moment, who's been on a lot of television, but I've heard the other people, sort of the, the vice presidents um, on various podcasts and radio shows, where they they just, they really nail the, the re, you know, the, the way that um, British Rail, for example, are, has... Um, basically has become responsible for dividends and other payments out to investors that can no longer be used, therefore, for either investing in the rail structure or in paying their employees. And they just say it in one sentence and, it, and add two more things, and it's, it's quite vivid. So it does feel like you're part of the process of you know, public education, um, where we may be making some progress towards understanding the the limits of the system we've been in for such this a long time. This is why time. I made that point that the the dominant theories of value that we've been working with are hundreds of years old. Yeah, and the the time uh, you know has more than come to reevaluate yeah. how we think about um, these systems. Yeah, you're so right, and you're very patient about it too. I mean, it's just completely exasperating. <laughs> All right, well, let me just thank the four of you for um, for participating in this conversation and to the audience for asking such great questions, Dave, for writing it. And let me just say how sorry I am that we're not about all, not about to just walk together to next door for a reception and then head off to dinner so we can continue this live. We'll try to do that next time. Thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.